As Ty mentioned, I have been a dietitian for a while, so I think I'm coming up in over 20 years now. And I've seen really the conversation around food change quite a bit in the past uh, 20 some years. And it used to be that I was able to be pretty uh, proactive about messages to consumers and talking about things like, this is how you get fiber in your diet. And oh, so you're newly do diagnosed with diabetes, and this is what you need to look at on a label. And probably about five or six years ago, I really felt, maybe even a little longer, I really felt the conversation had begun to change quite a bit. And I started hearing consumers really express a lot of concerns about food. And I would even call them uh, very strong fears about food. And whether I was at a, doing a presentation or I was doing a tour in the store, I started hearing things repeatedly. And this was, these were some of the things I was hearing. You may recognize some of these as uh, Michael Pollan's food rules. This is not meant to be a session bashing Michael Pollan, but I frequently use a hashtag called pollinated. And these are some of his food rules from his um, omnivore's dilemma. Now, as a dietitian, some of these I actually agree with, or I agree with parts of them. And what was really interesting, I think, about this last panel is I felt that there were elements to some of the things that they were saying towards the end that reflected some of Michael Pollan's food rules. Um, for example, shop at farmer's markets, um, eat foods that will eventually rot. I actually heard somebody say that to me, eat foods that will eventually rot. And I had to think for a moment. Um, well, let's see, nuts won't eventually rot, so um, yeah, there's that. Um, and then how you eat is as important as what you eat. I was never really sure about this one, if that was like more of a commentary on manners than it was on anything. Um, avoid products with more than five ingredients. And this last one really caught my attention the most, and, and you might have seen articles based on this whole concept. Don't eat anything your great, great, great grandmother wouldn't recognize this food. How many of you have seen something like that? Okay, I actually had people say that to me. Don't eat any, I don't eat anything my great-great-grandmother wouldn't recognize as food. So I thought that that was a really interesting notion, and probably about five or six years ago, I decided to write a blog about that notion. And in doing so, I sort of dug into that. Where did that come from? And this is what I found that was kind of surprising. Well, first of all, this is what a supermarket might have looked like in my great-grandmother's, great-great-grandmother's time. Um, and in 2006, this was where this notion first came up for Michael Pollan. Six rules for eating wisely. Don't eat anything your great-great-great-grandmother wouldn't recognize as food. That's that was the quote in that 2006 article in Time Magazine. In 2007 in New York Times, in an article entitled Unhappy Meals, he went on to write, eat food, don't eat anything your great-great-grandmother wouldn't recognize as food. So you see, six months later, he had dropped a whole generation. <laughs> How does that work? Did somebody come up to him and say, hey, Mike, well, you're looking back at like the 1820s. How accurate is that? And then uh, we saw uh, in April 2008 in an NPR interview, Michael Pollan had changed it again when his book The Omnivore's Dilemma came out. And it became, if your great-grandmother wouldn't recognize it as food, then neither should you. So now he had gone from great-great-great-grandmother to great-grandmother. So how does that work, that you're able to drop whole generations in a matter of two years. So what this is, I just learned this phrase recently. It's called, it's an appeal to an irrelevant authority. There's a book out called Bad Arguments. So there's a whole discussion of um, what are bad arguments. So using that kind of argument, what would my great-grandmother recognize as food, is an appeal to an irrelevant authority. My great-grandmother is dead. What she would recognize as food is not necessarily what I would recognize as food. This is my great-grandmother. You know, when I put that up, every time I put that up, people laugh. I'm like, no, seriously, that is my great-grandmother. <laughs> seriously.
So this is my great grandmother, and people are like, oh, her stare is so intense and almost chilling. Yes, it, it really is. If you kind of, her eyes kind of follow you in the room. Her, her name was Mercedes Guabara. And you're like, seriously, really, Mercedes Guabara? Yes, my great grandmother was Mexican, and she grew up probably in Mexico and then uh, moved to the Colorado and New Mexico area. So, um, what would my great grandmother have recognized as food? Well, she would have recognized smoked meats because that's how you preserve meats in those times. Ham would have been quite common before refrigeration. She would have pickled her vegetables when they weren't in season. She would probably have had access to apples for part of the year because they store well. She would have had access to potatoes and sweet potatoes. Um, sort of ciders and beers would have been things that she would recognize. Breads, she would definitely recognize all those foods. So all those foods are still part of our common culture. We still recognize them as food. We're all good there. But um, her day would have been quite different than what our time is like now, how we spend our time. This is from a, an article of a, like a diary of a woman from 1915. My great-grandmother lived from 1864 to 1946. Okay, so she lived through the Great Depression. She lived through the flu pandemic that killed millions of people around the world. She lived through World War I and through most of World War II. But this would have been a description of her day, about nine hours worth of work every day just to take care of her family and put food on the table. How does that compare to what we're doing now? How many of you spend nine hours a day on preparing food and doing housework? Any, anybody spend nine hours a day? Okay, this gentleman in the first row says he does. He's actually, he has a business car. Oh, there you go. He's a farmer. There you go. So the typical uh, woman right now, because this was a woman back then, is probably spending less than an hour per day on housework and food preparation in the course of a day compared to nine hours in a day. So here's a little quiz for you. Here are some items. Which of these do you think my great-grandmother or your great-grandmother would have recognized as food? Anybody? All of them, none of them, one or two of them, what do you think? So we've got chips, we've got uh, Coke, we've got Dr. Pepper, Wonder Bread, Krikoros, Hershey Chocolate Bar, and we've got Heinz Ketchup. The answer is that she would have recognized all of those as food. All of those would have been items that my great-grandmother would have had available to her, probably introduced well before the 1920s. Things like Dr. Pepper and your Coca-Colas were introduced in the 18, later, the 1880s. And then um, Hershey was actually the last one. The chocolate bar was introduced in like 1920. So all these items, all these items that a lot of times you hear the diet demagogues sort of uh, defaming were actually all a part of our culture in either the latter part of the 19th century or the early part of the 20th century. They're not new novelty items. They're not responsible for the downfall of, of our diets because they were, they've been around for a long time since my great-grandmother was around. How about these items? Which do you recognize? Banana, broccoli, kiwi, hummus? Because if we're using that model, don't eat anything your great-grandmother wouldn't recognize as food, my great-grandmother wouldn't have recognized any of these. Bananas were a novelty introduced to the United States in uh, Philadelphia Centennial, and they were wrapped in aluminum foil, and they were sold for the equivalent of an hour's wages. So that would have been about, that banana nowadays would be, have been worth $7.25, roughly, something like that. Um, they only became more widely available in the 19th and early 20th century. They were tropical fruit. They weren't growing in them in the United States, despite what some of my customers in the supermarket are convinced that bananas are grown locally in the United States. <laughs> Hummus was actually introduced only when people began to emigrate from countries like the, in the, from the Middle East. So it was more served in their homes. And it wasn't really until the 1980s it was sold commercially. Now if you go to any supermarket, you can see I mean, in our supermarket, we have probably 10 or 15 different brands of hummus. And hummus is widely popular, but my great-grandmother would not have recognized it. So you probably shouldn't eat it as a food. 
kiwi. Um, they were introduced as Chinese gooseberries, um, but not until really 1962. Immensely popular now, but not something my great-grandmother would have recognized as food. Broccoli, another item that is only become more widely available into the 20, in the 1920s and into the early part of the 20th century. So what I've done is just take one of these food rules, these food myths, and sort of explore and dig deeper into it and really try and illustrate to people when you really start thinking about this kind of sound bite nutrition, these food rules, you know, what's behind that? Do, do they actually make any sense at all? We have so many things that have been responsible. You, in the last panel, you ta they talked about advances in science. We've actually also seen so many advances in just technology in our home and food preser preservation that have been responsible for those time-saving devices to take women out of the home for nine hours a day and into the workforce. Um, everything from the canning to the dishwasher being invented and available. Um, fun fact, the dishwasher, no surprise, was invented by a woman. That doesn't surprise me at all. Um, so then we saw things like aseptic canning, UHT milk, plastic packaging, organic foods and GMO and, uh, in the latter part of the 20th century. Um, so when I started really looking into um, these food myths, one of the things I was doing at the same time was talking to seniors in my community. And this was a gentleman from my church, Bob Evans. And I would go to these seniors in the, in the nursing homes and ask them questions about their food recollections from when they were growing up. And what were their favorite meals? How available was food? What was available? And this gentleman had a quote that I really appreciated. And he was just, when I, when I said to him, what would you say if somebody said, we should eat the way our grandparents or great grandparents ate? He basically laughed out loud. He said, he said, all winter long, I had to eat apples. That was the only fresh fruit that was available. I mean, yeah, my mom preserved things, but it was basically just apples. He said, we were, we were doing this interview in one of our stores, and he said, look, I can get strawberries, I can get blueberries, I can get them frozen, I can get them fresh, I can get them canned. So I don't want to go back to just eating apples all winter long. And then he also talked about just how many advances there have been in medicine that, um, that we kind of take for granted now. So this was some interesting data from um, the Hartman Group about top consumer fears. And again, like reflecting back to what I said, started with, I think we have a population that is so scared of food right, right now. And a lot of times I feel that there's really no good reason for that compared to what life was like back in the uh, early part of the 20th century and 19th century. Um, there's contamination, uh, they're afraid of contamination by bacteria and germs, and you see how these fears have e actually ratcheted up from 2015 to 2016 rather than decreasing. We're getting a population that's more and more and more concerned and has more and more food fears. It's not becoming less. Um, this one, for who, how, who's involved with meat production or yeah. So does anybody know what's going on here with this meat? Do you know what the term is for when the, the meat's red on the outside and darker on the inside? Right. So it's bloom, right? So that when you expose the, the inside to air, it will bloom up and turn red. When it's packaged tightly, it's darker in color, right? That is the, the number one thing our meat department gets questions about, the ground beef. Why are you packaging up bad meat, like surrounding it with fresh meat? Number one thing. They're convinced they don't understand that sort of science. And so one of the things I always tell people is, look at your arm. What color are your veins? Okay? They're, they're blue. They're gray, right? If I cut you, is the blood going to come out blue and, or gray? No, it comes out red. So that's how I sometimes illustrate that point to people about what bloom is. As a supermarket dietitian, I am seeing just an overwhelming amount of um, marketing to fear-based uh, concerns. And um, for some of you who are involved in the marketing space, um, 
I don't know what to tell you because some of this is probably going to offend you. But um, as a as a dietitian, um, this is a really tough space for me to navigate and to really talk people down off this fear ledge because it seems like so many of the food fads and the food fears are being reflected in marketing. We've got clean eating lists. We've got clean labels. We've got a simple ingredient list. We've got non-GMO on products that so don't even have a GMO equivalent. We've got organic. We've got sustainable. We've got cage-free, free range, no sugar added, um, sugar-free, and these are just again and again and again and again appeals to fear. Um, I would love to go back to a time when people talked about how great their products tasted. Can we, can we do that? Can we just talk about how good something tastes or how it was raised rather than really market to fear? I would love to go back where this is, this is what a cleanse was. <laughs> and this is what clean eating means. It's like, let's just wash your hands. That's clean eating. Um, I've actually heard people say, um, I thought, you know, I don't eat anything with more than four or five ingredients. Hmm, I can think of a lot of things with more than four or five ingredients as, as a dietitian I wouldn't necessarily recommend. But this is a, a meme that I made up. I, I try and use humor a lot of times in my messages to maybe get people to think a little bit about these things that they're saying. So potato chips. Well, I guess that makes Michael Pollan standard as having less than four or five ingredients. Um, here's uh, some non-GMO project label things. Uh, I, I didn't know that uh, pink sea salt, pink salt had uh, DNA in it. Did you? But I guess it qualifies for a non-GMO project label. How about cat litter? Yep. <laughs> for my consumers who say, well, I buy the non-GMO project label because it means it's healthier. There you go. It's cat litter, right? <laughs> Tell you. Um, I love to remind people of this quote. I probably remind people on Twitter at least once a week that the organic label is a certification of agricultural standards, not an endorsement of nutrition or food safety. Thank you, Dan Glickman, for saying that, and thank you, whoever created that meme, because I use it all the time. It drives people who are um, love to worship at the altar of organic and the organic label crazy, but I, I think it's worth reminding people um, of that fact. Um, I think there's somebody from Jones Farm in here, right? So um, no sugar is definitely a trend or a fad, sugar, no sugar added. And so we have a no sugar bacon. So um, I didn't really even think about the fact that bacon might have sugar in it. And when I looked at a nutrition facts panel, I decided, well, it really doesn't have much sugar in it because it's so small that it's less than one gram per serving. So what happens there when you start to promote messages like that, then you have people who have diabetes saying, oh, this is the bacon that I need to buy because it has no sugar in it. Well, no, if you've got diabetes, you've got bigger problems than thinking about less than one gram of sugar in a serving of bacon. And on the other side of the coin, we have people who can't get enough of the uh, unicorn frappuccino. So you go between these two extremes. I want to have a no sugar added bacon, but I want to have a Star Starbucks unicorn frappuccino that has probably 50 grams of sugar in um, one tall frappuccino. We heard hormone-free on the last panel. So about every Thanksgiving, I hear people say to me, or they write to me and say, um, do you have any turkeys that are hormone-free? Do you sell any turkeys that are hormone-free? Important time to remind them that, that we don't administer hormones to turkeys or, or hogs in the United States. So it's illegal to do that, but that doesn't stop the marketing from putting things like hormone-free on a label. Uh, and this one, I, is there anybody from milkadamia in the room? I didn't think so. Okay, um, so you probably can't see this, but who's from the milk? Who's milk people? Here's milk. Okay. So just so you know, I, I don't call them uh, milks. I call them nut juices, which is not as politically correct. <laughs> but 
if you see the little round circle logo on it, it actually says free range. <laughs> it, it really does say free range. So you may be wondering, what, now when you see free range on a box of um, macadamia nut milk, I don't know about you, but for me, the image that came to mind was Lord of the Rings and the trees that are like marching angrily. That's when I get, is that a free range macadamia nut tree? So I actually contacted the company and I said, seriously, free, free range? And they said, um, they're not hooked up to artificial life support. <laughs> what does that mean? Uh, well, they're, they, they don't, they're not, uh, uh, they don't have irrigation. It's just natural. I'm like, oh, so, all right. <laughs> so what do I think is responsible for all of this? I, I really, I mean, I am a big fan of social media. Um, Amber can tell you and, and that I'm a big fan of social media and Twitter and Facebook, but I also think that it's responsible for a lot of this. Um, when you start looking at the timeline of, when I started looking at the timeline of what was going on with the introduction of Facebook and then Twitter, it started to make sense to me. I know that correlation is not causation, but it seems to be just very coincidental that a lot of the fears that consumers have when I started hearing more about them really started to tally with what was going on when people started spending a lot more time on social media. Look at the difference in the hours. In 2005, people were spending 30 minutes a day outside of work on the Internet. In 2014, two hours and 18 minutes a day outside of work on the Internet. That's a fantastic, huge increase in the amount of time that they're exposed to all these different kinds of messages. Um, and I think that well, I want to ask a question. Ten years ago, how many of you subscribed to a, a local newspaper? Keep your hands up. How many of you who ten years ago subscribed to a local newspaper are still subscribing today? Put your hand down if you, or keep your hand up if you're still subscribed. Put it down if you're no longer subscribing. I think that that, you see a lot of people's hands went down. I think that that's where people are getting news from. They're not getting, they're getting news from Facebook is a lot of times the number one vehicle for their information where they're getting news not only about local community but national and the stories, these videos that you heard uh, the panel uh, refer to, they're seeing those pop up on their news feed. So that's what we really have to deal with and what we really have to compete with. So I'm going to let Amber tell you a little bit about some of the strategies that um, she uses and that she's going to recommend for all of us. Hello, everyone. Pleasure to be with you today. So as a reminder, my name is Amber Pankinen. I always tell my anchors that I'm working with back home, it's Pankinen Rhymes with Spankinen. You'll never forget how to pronounce my last name. So I am employed by the University of Nebraska. I teach adjunct there. And then I have my own business doing nutrition communications consulting. And you can tell by my client list that I am a huge fan of animal agriculture. So I definitely support all of you in this room. I'm also serving as president of the Nebraska Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics this year. We're the largest group of food and nutrition professionals in the state of Nebraska. So I'm very proud of our members. So I'm going to just touch briefly on how to engage efficiently and effectively. And then after I'm done, we'll take some questions. But I wanted to focus on this part now that Leah has addressed some of those myths. And you know, even in the panel this morning, we heard some of those myths, right? And you wanted to get up and just say, let me help you. <laughs> let me inform you. And I know that all of you in this room are incredibly busy, right? You're very busy. So your time is very val valuable. So when you are carving out even that five minutes to get on social media or to have a conversation with the consumer, you want that time to be, or you want it to be worth your time and the person who's asking that question, correct? 
And you also want to be effective with that time because we know that sometimes what's efficient isn't always effective and vice versa. So who are we trying to reach? And I think this is the tough part because the reality is, folks, there are just some people that you're not going to connect with. And I know you're probably thinking of that person right now in your mind, aren't you? Your mind went there. There are those folks that you're just not going to convince or sway either direction. And then on the other side of the spectrum, we have that 10% of people who really just don't care. And maybe that was a couple of these folks up here, right? But you saw the other 10% who do care. And then there are those folks who were right in the middle. And we call those the movable middle, that hopefully, you know, maybe with taking some time to chat with them and talk with them, you know, we can give them some insight on what we do every day. So just a little formula for you as we kind of walk through this as far as, you know, how do you have those conversations with consumers? I'm sorry, I don't think this is advancing, if you want to just advance it for me how to engage. And so this is by no means a perfect formula, but in my training with uh, Midwest Dairy, Monsanto, and um, Common Ground Nebraska, this seems to be a common theme here. So first is to listen for the opportunity to engage. So that might be online, that might be a conversation in the grocery store, finding the shared value. What do you and I have in common? What can we connect about? Asking permission. I know this is a tough one, and you think, that, well, duh, you know, of course, you know, you have permission to, to talk to somebody or tell me more. But that can be a real, uh, I think, impactful thing to do in conversation. And I'll give you some examples of that in a moment. And then sharing your story and then the science. So I was talking with Wanda and Michelle, the farm babe, last night. And, you know, we were all agreeing that we do a really bad job of telling our stories. But you've got those folks like Wanda and Michelle who are actually doing a really good job through their blogs, through social media, of telling their story every single day. So I love this quote by Stephen Covey. Most people do not listen with the intent to understand. They listen with the intent to reply. As a nutrition communicator, I am so guilty of this, right? How many of you would agree with this statement? Several of you, right? Because you just want to, you just want to jump right in. You want to cut them off and say, no, let me tell you more about this. And the truth is that we really just need to take a chill pill and listen. And then we can actually respond, uh, I think, more intelligently. So listening. All right, so there's this two-step process here. First is listening. So what I like to do is try to recognize the emotion in the consumer's question or statement. So when I'm having a conversation either in person or maybe it's on social media, now I know this sounds a little awkward, but I try to assign them an emoji. <laughs> so what would their emoji be? Are they mad? Are they happy? Are they stressed? If they have hearts in their eyes, I run away. So, I mean, you, you, it's just a kind of a, a fun way to think about really where is their emotion coming from. And then identifying that real problem that they're trying to solve or figuring out what the deeper issue is. And you can ask lots of questions to figure out what that deeper is or deeper issue is. We saw up here today, remember the mom with the son? So she talked early on how she, you know, has her son and, and she cares. And then later on it was revealed, right, that he has, was it ADHD? And she was concerned about red dye 40. So again, that was the deeper issue right there. <laughs> this is another temptation for us. I love this quote. This is by a journalist, Ben Shapiro. Facts don't care about your feelings. Again, I am, I am this person. And so I've had to really work hard to try and listen and be empathetic towards people that I'm talking to. And I think sometimes when we're having those conversations or trying to dispel the myths, we want to jump right to this. And you may say, oh, the, oh, that's cute. But when you lead with the science and the information, this is how they feel. Facts don't care about your feelings. Am I right? Yes. Okay. So when you're responding, asking for permission to share more information with them. Uh, when you ask for permission, I think that just opens the door for a deeper relationship. Respond by starting with emotion and then switch to the science and logic. Because if you lead with the science, you're going to lose them right away. 
you have to be likable. And I know that that seems kind of like a, well, duh, but you have to be likable and you have to think about your facial expression. You have to think about your body language, especially if you're having a face-to-face -face conversation. When you're online, what kind of language are you using? I'm not talking about profanity, <laughs> but what kind of words are you using? Are you using terminology that they're familiar with or that they're not familiar with? You have to meet them where they're at. And then directing them to other resources. And this is something as dietitians we've really tried to do in our practice that, you know, if somebody has a question about uh, kidneys or heart disease, you know, what I try to do is I pick up the phone and I call the expert dietitian in that area and I say, hey, I have some questions about this. Can I ask you or can I refer this person to you? And I would encourage you all to do that as well. So if it's a question that you don't know how to answer, you know, try to reach out to your network, you know, that folks could talk to and actually get those questions answered. Here's an example. And we heard this earlier, too. So let's walk through this. I've heard this so many times. Gosh, I, you know, I hear that farmers are using so many hormones in, in chicken production, and that's why they're getting so big and falling over. Right? I'm concerned that if I feed my, my children poultry products, right, that they're going to mature faster, that this is going to be unhealthy for them. You know, this is a myth that I've had to, to talk through with people several times. And so how would we approach this? So one, listening for that opportunity. Hey, this is where you want to acknowledge the concern and try to build them up a little bit. You know, I commend the care that you are taking uh, by giving or the care that you are giving to your family's health and well-being. And like you, I care about that too. I care about my family and the food that I feed them. And then you find that that shared value, and that shared value here is uncertainty, right? They, they don't truly understand where their food comes from. So you can say, you know, in an uncertain world, there are many things that parents can't control. But providing enough food, especially safe food, is fundamental to feeding or to feeling secure as a parent. Um, that next step would be to ask for permission. So would you, be, would you mind if I shared more information with you about this? Right? Again, you're asking for permission, and then you get to share your story, and you can say, you know, the good news is that here in the U.S., we have the world's safest food supply. You don't need, even need to worry about that. And then you can tell them about the science. For example, we don't add hormones to chickens or give them additional hormones. So online conversations, just a few tips for this. I think the first one would be don't feed the trolls. This is something I had to, uh, I don't know, come to grips with a couple of years ago. Otherwise, you will spend hours online going back to that particular Facebook feed or that particular t tweet, right, trying to respond and make your case known. And that can just be worthless, especially if they're in that 10%, right, who will never change their mind. They're just there for one reason and one reason only, and that is to troll you. Keep in mind that posts, especially online, right, they can and probably will be taken out of context or manipulated. So just being careful about the language that you're using, how you're addressing folks. Uh, you know, this has happened to both Leah and I where tweets of ours or posts of ours have been <laughs> posted in other blogs and taken out of context. So that's just something to learn from. And then, of course, remembering who your audience is. It's that movable middle, right? Those folks that you know you can hopefully connect with and provide some additional education. So some takeaways here, you know, as Leah mentioned, uh, when she, you know, she's been doing this for a lot, lot longer than I have, uh, but when I started as a dietitian even seven years ago, the questions that I got were, what do I do for my high blood pressure? What do I eat for my heart disease? And now today, you know, the questions that I get are, uh, I, you know, I just, I don't know if I can eat this tomato. Uh, is it safe to eat because I'm afraid it's GMO? You know, those are the kind, of, the kind of questions that I'm receiving. Dietitians are trained as the food and nutrition experts. We're not trained as the food and agriculture experts. And so even for myself, growing up in Nebraska, where the number one industry in the state 
is agriculture. You know, I found myself really not knowing how to answer those questions. And my grandparents were farmers. So I had that connection. Uh, but again, you have to take time to educate and inform yourself. So have confidence in your knowledge. And I would encourage all of you with this because I know I've had conversations with you uh, building that online in the past or even today. You have some incredible knowledge to share and I want to learn from you and hopefully maybe you can learn from us as well. Uh, because registered dietitians, we're on the front lines of this. So there's a grocery chain here in the Midwest, you're probably well familiar with it. Uh, they have, I think, over 200 stores here in the Midwest. And they have a dietitian in every single store. And some stores have at least two dietitians. Do the math on that. They are getting asked questions every single day about what you do, and they may not know how to answer. So I think later on today you're learning how to do or host an influencer tour. I think I saw that on the schedule. Keep in mind the power of registered dietitians and the influence that we can have on consumers. And take time to educate us, engage with us, and enlighten us. Because we love education. I mean, we love it. <laughs> we have to get lots of continuing ed for our license. And so it's okay. You can tell us more about what you do, and we want to learn from you. And then finally, expanding that network and getting out of your bubble. You know, today, when you saw that panel, it probably was a little uncomfortable to hear those things. But those are the real conversations that are happening. And so those are the types of people we need to connect with and hear more from. So with that, I think we're going to open it up for questions. So I think the college Aggies are going to be running microphones around. If you have a question, just uh, raise your hand. But while they do that, while you think of your questions, I do have a couple questions for each of you. Um, the first one, um, you know, you guys talked about communicating with dietitians and really educating and doing that. So how can, can farmers and ranchers and folks that are involved in animal agriculture, how can they better can communicate with not only you, uh, but some of the health professionals in our own community who are giving advice uh, to some of their, some of their uh, patients as well? Um, so uh, all dietetic, uh, well, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics has state affiliates, and sometimes they have regional and even city affiliates. So those are great opportunities for agriculture folks to engage with dietitians in your city, your state, um, in your region. And I would say probably those same kind of opportunities exist with healthcare professionals that Tyne mentioned. So I would try and reach out to those folks because they are hungry for information from you. Um, one of the things, just as a little aside, um, one of the things that we heard at that one panel was how many of those people have been exposed to documentaries about our food system. And I had some conversations during the break that, you know, this is a space that you all should be in. And, and the activists have beaten you to the punch with a lot of these what I call shockumentaries. And their, their books, these documentaries are in middle schools, they're in high schools, they're in colleges, they're shown um, in fine arts theaters, they're available in libraries. So I would challenge you guys, where are you? Because the activists are there. How are you going to get your messages out about with movies like documentaries like Farmland, which is one of the few that I actually know about, and I know that the Farm Bureau makes available to schools for the Ag in the Classroom program. But um, we need to be, if we're advocates, as nimble as the activists in order to get those positive messages about agriculture and farming. Yeah, I'll just uh, add to what Leah said. As president of our Nebraska affiliate, we have 600 dietitians in Nebraska. I think Kansas has about eight to 900. Other states are higher, you know, 4,000, 6,000 members. So, uh, you know, I think that's a great place to start. You can sponsor state meetings, even local and district meetings. You know, we just finished with our conference and we had uh, Kim Bremer, who I think some of you know, came and spoke, and she was excellent. So I think just trying to connect with those local dietetic leaders. Okay, we have a question a few rows back. If you just want to give your name and where you're from, and that way we can get an idea, that'd be great. Sure, I'm Angie. I'm from Vader Rudder. And I have... A 
a similar question. Um, how did you get involved with the farm and the knowledge sharing piece to this? Because I have a, an assumption that for dietitians, the farm background is much in the minority. Myself, I had two dietitians when I was pregnant with two different children, and they both told me, I'm up here. Where are you at? There. I'm right here, sorry. Where am I looking? And, there you and are. they both told me to watch forks, forks over knives, and they both told me to lead with organic. So I was really frustrated as a Wisconsin farm kid to hear that was their advice to me instead of carbs and what I should be eating. And I did actually comment back to them that I thought that their direction was a bit off and that we needed to have a longer conversation. But as you look to that and, and your field, I get that we should engage, but what's the uphill battle here and, and what's the real success rate of this? I, I completely agree we need to. Um, but where do we start? Yeah. Well, um, I would agree that there's, you know, not all dietitians are created equal. I'm not saying that we're like superhero dietitians or anything like that, but we're sort of superheroes. <laughs> we um, think you are. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I think for a lot of them, it, it goes back to their middle school, high school uh, experience, their college experience, what they were taught, what the preceptors are teaching them, what the professors are teaching them, um, you know, as Amber pointed out, we're food and nutrition, we're not food and nutrition and agriculture experts. And like so many consumers, many dietitians are equally as removed from that farming experience. I know for me, um, about four or five years ago, I decided, you know, I, why am I not going out and talking to the farmers that supply our supermarket? You know. I started, I went to Nebraska to visit um, a beef operation and I thought I can do this in my own backyard and start writing about it and learning about it and it was just something I started doing. And I think we're seeing more dietitians get into that space now, but um, a lot of them are pollenites, I'll say it. There are a lot of them, that are, they, they will quote you, Michael Pollan. Um, so there's a lot of education that still needs to happen. And um, I was using the example of like plumbers and dentists. They're, you wouldn't recognize, you wouldn't recommend every plumber, right? You wouldn't recommend any every dentist. I don't recommend every dietitian. And it's because we sometimes people forget that um, nutrition is a science, not an opinion and not a belief system. And I'm not quoting myself there. That's somebody else. So. To follow up on that, but do you think that science matters to oh, these consumers? You do. Oh, do I think that science matters to, to consumers, consumers today? Mm -hmm. I think I will say what Amber. Uh, I think they're. I think you have to listen to what their first concern is, and and you can't lead with the science because that is not going to address that concern. You can't say, well, um, you know. Four out of five doctors recommend if, if they're telling you about um, their child has health problems or food allergies and they have read online, it's due to the GMOs. So you've got to hit that point of empathy like uh, Amber recommended and then, then try and maybe slowly and gradually talk to them about science. And do you think they're receptive whenever you do end up talking about the, the science? Because it seems like today just some of the science is cherry-picked. You know, some of the arguments, they really cherry-pick what science, when it comes down to the science of what we, you know, the production methods today, um, they don't always trust it, and they don't trust the numbers. But at other times, they use science to really back their arguments. So, Right. I think, you know, we just saw recently the March for Science. You know, I don't know how many of you attended that, maybe in your area, but Lee and I were talking about this, that... Uh, I don't know if you want to tell the story about your science march, but I think ours was similar, that you have people who are very, who say they're very passionate about science, but they want to ignore science when it has to do with agriculture. Right. Yeah, my experience was um, in Asheville, North Carolina, which is a very, it's what we call it the boulder of the east. So, so it's a hotbed of alternative medicine. There's probably the ratio of like uh, naturopaths, chiropractors, acupuncturists, it's probably like 100 to 1 or something. I don't know, it's crazy. But our March for Science started out really well, and then a physician got up and said, you know, it was pro-vaccine, pro-research, pro-cancer research. I'm like, yay, yay, yay. And then she's like, but then there's a big ag and how they treat our animals and how they 
drench crops with pesticides, the glyphosate that gets into our, that's what she said, the glyphosate that gets into all of our food and is causing allergies and obesity and cancer and autism. And my, my mouth just dropped open from this physician, this healthcare provider. And then a biology professor basically said the same thing. So there is this sort of cherry picking of science, but you know, again, as Amber said, that we have to focus on the movable middle because there are some people that you're not going to be able to, um, you're not gonna be able to convince them either with that empathy or that, um, that the listening and the feeling, and, um, and you're certainly not gonna be able to convince them with science. Okay, I think we have a If you want to stand up, too, so they can, they can see you. Thank sure. Thank you. My name is Laura. I work with the Illinois Soybean Association. Uh, so just like you guys said that the types of questions that you've gotten have changed over time, do you see, especially Amber as an educator of dietitians, do you see the reasons for people getting into dietetics changing? And are you seeing more of those people not being in that movable middle for us trying to educate them? And I ask that because... My sister is also in the dietetics industry, and she's also educating, and that's a comment she's made to me. I wonder if that's something that is widespread or isolated. Yeah, I think it depends maybe on where they are studying. Uh, I know for me, even at the University of Nebraska, we have students that come in because they want to be activists. And so that's a real danger when you are professional because there's a fine line between professionalism and activism, and you have to learn the difference. And that's something that I try to teach my students. But you know, I always ask at the beginning of the semester, raise your hand if you have grown up on a farm or you're from a farm, and it's awesome because half the room raises their hand. Well, we're in Nebraska, right? If you go to some of these other states that aren't as ag friendly, you know, you'll get a different response. And so it's been neat just to see students educate one another so that I can just sit back and I say, Ah, you know, tell me more about what you do on your farm. And, you know, and then they have those conversations, and that's been really helpful. But you're right. We, we do see a lot of students enter the field just because they feel very passionate, you know, about a particular subject. But, you know, by the same token, I work with students as well, and I usually start off trying to figure out where they are. And then um, I do exercise with them, like I, I have them go visit farmers of different types. I have them talk to people, I have them price organic products, non-GMO, GM, what, and do papers, answer questions, and I see them moving um, from this point of, oh, I only shop at the healthy supermarket, you know what that one is, there's only one healthy supermarket evidently in the United States, and um, I only buy organic, I only shop at farmer's markets, I only buy local, I don't know how they managed to do that in like December in North Carolina, but you know, whatever. And watch them kind of move, and they do manage to move, but yes, I agree that there are people who go into this field with a, an established agenda. Okay, we have a question right back, right back here. I'm Don Hecht, I'm a past employee of Elanco Animal Health and past chair of the Animal Ag Alliance Board. Uh, I'm, uh, blessed to have three kids living in three parts of the country, Chicago area, California, and Maryland. And one of my hobbies is going into grocery stores and asking people behind the meat counter questions about what they're selling. And I'm just wondering, <laughs> do, you, do you have on your agendas educating people in your own stores? Because uh, the uh, level of uh, knowledge behind the meat counter in most grocery stores is pretty low. Well, so you know that most of the people, I mean, we have full service meat counters in our store, and, we're, and that's kind of going away in many stores, and, you know, or maybe it's coming back in some more specialty stores. Um, it's hard to find people that are uh, want to be meat cutters anymore. You know, there's big issues with that. Um, but we do have training programs, and, and I do uh, have, uh, I do put out messages in our. Um, monthly news, or I guess it's monthly or quarter, no, it's monthly newsletter to employees about different topics like that. I don't know if they read it or not, but um, yeah, it's, um, they don't know. They, because I, I get questions from them about things like GMO and hormones and antibiotics and things like that, but I'm glad they're coming to me to ask me those questions. Do you hold any, I mean, you do your newsletter, but do you hold any like one-on-one -on -one conversations or any kind of like uh, learning sessions for them to really know? Um, 
I don't. We have 23,000 employees. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Um, so I do get calls and emails oh, from yeah. them, but no, not individually. Right. Question over here. Hi, I'm Kate. I'm a poultry veterinarian, and I really appreciate you too with a very enlightening discussion and uh, the education that you're doing in your respective roles. Um, Leah, this question is for you. Um, in addition to trying to influence consumers um, in your stores, uh, particularly in the southeast, what are you trying to do um, to influence not only people that perhaps work at Ingalls, but also senior management that are making food decisions? And I'm particularly looking at, I believe in in providing choice, whether people want to buy standard or organic or, you know, whatever product they want. But particularly with poultry, we've seen huge changes in the retail and QSR type world where people are saying we're only going to go cage-free eggs. And now we're facing similar issues with broilers and, and we face similar issues with the, um, in the swine industry. So how do you try to influence those upper level managers to say, you know what, this is marketing, this is uh, about opinion, this is fiction um, perhaps, and this is not really going to make a, a valuable contribution to our consumers at the end of the day with regards to their nutrition? Well, you all know that well, what happened with the cage free situation, it was like a very activist driven situation that happened. And then once one retailer um, sort of made any kind of statement, then it was only a matter of time. It's like dominoes, right? It just everybody has to, feels like they have to kind of make the same sort of statement. So then it's, it's a very, um, then you're stuck, right? Once that first retailer says, okay, we're going to commit to cage free by 2020 or whatever it was, then everybody gets in line after that. So you can, I mean, I, uh, they've come to me on, on issues, and I'm very honored that they do. I've given feedback about many things, and sometimes they take it, and sometimes they don't. Um, I get the feeling a lot of times that um, the buyers and the vice presidents have been through this for so many years and seen so many fads and changes in consumer behavior and consumer preferences. So this is just another one that is going to eventually, you know, they have to provide these things because we're a supermarket, but it's just going to blow over and, and we'll be on to the next fad or the next preference. And um, But in order to compete with the other chains, we have to offer those things. Um, that being said, I like the fact that we are a supermarket and we offer organic and we offer uh, uh, local and we offer international and we offer you know, a wide range of choices because that is what it's about for us and for our consumers. So I don't know if that really answers your question. I don't know. Another question. We only have time for a couple more questions, but another question right back here. Hi, my name is Jody Halla. I'm with Christensen Farms, a pork producer in Minnesota, so thank you for being here. Um, my question would be to you, Amber. Um, a lot of the individuals that I, conversations that I have, certainly fall in that movable middle. And when it gets down to the conversations, we find ourselves pharmacists, doctors, who absolutely understand science. So where I get stuck is answering the question of, it might be better. I know that it, it uh, the science doesn't necessarily that it is better for me, but I'm going to err on the side of caution that it may be better for me. So I was wondering if you could offer some advice to those of us who find ourselves in those uh, conversations on how to answer their questions. Do you have a specific example? Uh, I guess just around the organic, and so I, I definitely agree with choice, but as consumers are on this quest to educate themselves on the choices that they want to make in the grocery store. Uh, this particular woman that I was talking with is a pharmacist, very well educated, very well, um, uh, definitely understands the science and the research, but there isn't anything that says that it, it, is, that it, that it isn't better for you. Right. I think I sometimes will just affirm them and I will say, well, I, I'm happy that you think that that's a good choice for your family. You know, you're doing a great job as a mom, I can tell. And you just try to affirm them in any way that you can. And somehow that seems to break down some of those barriers. Uh, and you know, being a pharmacist, she probably can't afford it. 
you know, and we say, I'm glad you have the choice to be able to afford that. You know, and I'm glad that works for your family. You know, but for my family, maybe as a farmer, this is what we do. And, you know, you can also talk about your friends and, you know, what they choose to do. And I think just bringing in some real world examples can, can help. Uh, I think if you were to, again, you know, not that you would call them names or anything like that, but just keep it positive. Keep the conversation positive and affirm them in the ways that you can. So I think uh, uh, we have a friend, Shelly Johnson, who's with the Beef, um, beef Board, and, a beef cowman. and she has a phrase that she uses like, um, just because you, you can say you like a grape, but you don't have to say, I hate the not grape. Does that make sense? It's like, it's okay to like grapes, but you don't have to hate the not grape. You know, so I think that that we have to say why we don't have to be negative about organic or local or anything like that. We can affirm, like Amber right. said, those choices because we know that you know consumers are not eating the recommended the recommended amount of fruits and vegetables every day. And so, if you can just say, "I'm happy you're getting your fruits and vegetables in," you know, again, just affirming them. Okay, time for one more quick question. I think we have one over here in the back. My name's Marcine Moldenhauer from down by Wichita, and we're farmers and beef producers, and thank you both for the work you do. My question to both of you is, I have a 15-year-old daughter, and the schools and the inundation of the so-called documentaries and the other false information normally that they get hit with in health classes and other classes in their school. Give some thoughts or ideas on how you guys would recommend, as producers, we try to counter that. I would say, I don't know, have you had a conversation with the teachers directly? Yes. Yeah, have you offered to teach? Maybe some of those portions. I know that's been effective uh, in Nebraska. You know, because when you're teaching those classes, you know, those folks—they're not registered dietitians. They're not personal trainers. They're not experts on health. And so they're just grabbing onto whatever forms of education that they can, and they think, ah, documentary, it's on Netflix, right? Here we go. You know, and I've, I've seen really good things come from producers who've, you know, addressed the teacher directly and said, I would love to teach this for you. Uh, would you mind if I, you know, came in and did this presentation? I think being proactive in that approach has been helpful. And if you don't get anywhere, then go to the school administrator. <laughs> Um, and so I would add, there, I just wrote an article on this. Your cooperative extension office is a great resource for, um, to help connect uh, classes with farmers and provide instruction even on that kind of thing. And for those of you who are with AGS, the AG department, you can, you know, you can um, reaffirm that. Um, also, the Farm Bureau does an amazing, and I'm not just saying that because y'all are here, but the Farm Bureau has an amazing, um, yes, yeah, she said I'm sucking up. If you see their drop down, they have an ag in the classroom that has pre made um, lesson plans for teachers for classes of all ages, and they show excerpts of the um, farmland movie that corresponds with different um, uh, curriculum themes like social studies, the challenges of the farmers. As I said earlier, the problem is is that the activists were here before us, uh, before you, and they got these books out, the documentaries out. I mean, I've had 70-year-old women tell me they've read, they've watched every documentary the library has to offer, and they name off Cowspiracy, GMO, OMG, Forks Over Knives, Fed Up, See the Untold Story, which was just on P PBS. And um, so we just need to be more proactive about being in that space and offering up um, that type of expertise to these teachers. Um, I just did, this is a, this is a definite plug. Um, if those of you are familiar with Food and Farm Discussion Lab that's on Facebook, um, Mark, is it Brazo? That's how, Brazo. 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 Um, I had kind of had this ranting blog about See the Untold Story, and I had made up all these things. I called it the, the uh, Shockumentary Bingo. Like all the things that you always see in these documentaries. Quote from Michael Pollan, our broken food system, workers in the field in hazmat suits spraying pesticides, animals crowded in crowded conditions, a really pretty organic farm, uh, a weathered farmer with a beard who's like 70 years old wearing faded jeans, 
I mean, and so he turned it into a bingo card, a shockumentary bingo card. And it was kind of a joke, but it's really to wake people up to, you're being manipulated by this type of messaging, which has these sort of images in it. And maybe that's the, the hook for some of these teachers. You know, make them see, like, are you being manipulated by these, me these messages that all follow that same format of, like, our broken food supply, um, toxins, pesticides, you know, a mom who has kids that are suffering from some strange malady that she attributes to GMOs or pesticides. So I think we just need to be out there and vocal. And like Amber said, contact the teacher. I mean, if it was your school lunch and you object to the school lunch, would you not go say, you know, I don't think the school lunch is any good. You're pro these kids are being programmed in this way in middle school and high school to have to have these opinions. Our vice president of produce, his daughter is now a vegan because she watched so many documentaries in school that were anti-animal ag. And he said, I don't know what to do. My daughter, he loves cooking steaks on his grill. He doesn't even like fruits and vegetables that much. He's the vice president of produce, but he loves a good steak on the grill. He goes, he goes now she won't even eat the steak because she's watched all these documentaries in school. We're already out of time, and I want to invite the next panel to, to come up. But while they're making their way up, one last question for each of you, just in a couple sentences. I mean, at the end of the day, this is about taking action. So what action do you think those in the audience should really take after they leave this summit? What advice would you have for them? Um, I think you need to figure out some way of engaging that um, fits you, your lifestyle, whether it's on Twitter or it's on Facebook or it's with your local school or your middle school or your Farm Bureau or your Cooperative Extension, find something that you're comfortable with engaging to spread positive messages about the food system and about animal agriculture because um, if you don't, somebody else will fill that space with something negative. Right. And I'll say, find a registered dietitian that you can connect with. You got two here today, I'll give you my card. Uh, but really, we can be advocates for you, and we can learn from each other, I think. And then secondly, you know, you've got to tell your story. All of us need to do a better job of sharing our story. So that's what I would encourage you to do. And Amber and Leah, will you be sticking around in case we had any more questions, any one-on-one? -on -one? Will you we'll be, be around here. today? Yeah. All right, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you so much.